No, you've just been talking away. I've just been talking away. We've been doing about five minutes and it wasn't recording. So when I said we were recording, we're not. We are now. We are we're now recording. So what have we covered in the five minutes of silence? We've covered uh, <laughs> Woody the Black Country Bastard. <laughs> Woody the Wizard of Warwick. Warwickshire. <laughs> <laughs> or Worcestershire. Yeah, Woody the did. Wizard of Worcestershire we did, currently um, resided in Warwickshire. We were talking about uh, nicknames and I, I recollected the guy... I, I'm going to have to really shorten this down. I'm going to shorten this story down probably to the length it should have been in the first place rather okay. than me waffling on. The guy who I served with, he left just after I joined. We didn't really know each other. However... He, Remembering him randomly the other day made me think of you because the first time you came on the podcast, we were talking about nicknames for sure. Yeah. And this guy had an oddly shamed head, a shaped head, like it was like a birth defect or something. He's he had p- perfect cognitive function, I think. Um, <laughs> but he, his head was really oddly shaped, like it was compressed in on one side or whatever. And his nickname was Nick Knack or Nick Knack Head. We had a good old laugh at that. And then what was the story you came on to? We went. We were going onto a guy who I knew called Gaz, right. who looked like the blue Sam the American Eagle out of the Muppet Show, who who had a very distinctive "Good morning, everyone," and he, he had a head like Sam the Eagle from the Muppet Show. My God! <laughs> My Characters God. we used to come across in the forces. Yeah, and the names you give him. Oh yeah. The names you give him. There's another one called Gene Jorksby, and I he, he looked like Quark off Deep Space Nine, one of the characters. And this guy called uh, Stan used to see him. He's go, can anyone smell, smell foxes wee around here? <laughs> <laughs> My God. My oh. God. I, I, you, you like your World War II stuff, I, and I've just been doing... See that book there? I do. Have you met Lloyd? Don't think so, no. No. So he, he uh, he's local. I don't know. He's local, so I don't. As you know, <laughs> I don't really me- read much many war books. I don't, not anymore. I used to read some, but yeah. I don't anymore. And he's doing. Um, he's he's a local local author, and he's doing. Uh, they're fictional books, mm. right? But they're based on based on a fictional SAS character who goes around hunting down ex Nazis. Oh no, Nazis after the Second World War. Yeah. To enact his revenge upon them. Oh. Mm. Because there was actually after the war a a secret SAS team set and up, and he was part of that. Yeah. But when that gets closed down, he carries on. He wants to carry on, and yeah. his name in the book is um, Willett. Jo- uh, is it George Willett? The character's name is George Willett, and he wants to keep going until he's got every single one of them. It sounds good. And book. this is the first book, the short book, it's called "The Last Nazi Hunter: Desert mm. Rats." And I, this isn't me plugging it. I was li- I'm recording the audio book for him, which is why it's in you right now. I did yeah. it just before you arrived. But they're good fun. They're good fun, yeah. Good. Yeah. So there was a legit, there was a legit, because I read it, I first read it in mm. the book here for Lloyd, that piece of history. So what do you know about it? After the war in 1940, ended in May 1945, they actually <laughs> set up a secret SAS group to hunt down Nazi war criminals and either take, take them um, to trial. And there was a very good book called The Seven Escapes of Alistair. I can't remember his last name. But he was, after he did his last... Give me your coffee cup there, mate. No, thank you, mate. After his last escape, he was a part of that unit as well to hunt down ex-members of the uh, Gestapo and SS who'd uh, committed war crimes. And, uh, And also... There was lots of war crimes are committed against the obviously special air service because Hitler brought in a thing called the uh, commander order, and what the commander order was, any members of the commandos, special air service, and special operations executive, or anyone caught behind enemy lines, either in uniform or not uniform, the commander be feel, yes, it will be hunted yeah. down and killed. Now, the reason they say, the historical fact is, the reason why Hitler bought in that commando order was because in 19, I think 1940, the commandos were first called independent companies, then they took the name commandos. What they did, they did a raid on Guernsey. They did a raid on Guernsey. What happened was, after the commandos left, 
Apparently, the Germans found four German soldiers with their hands tied behind their back, with obviously the bullet holes in the back of the head, executed. So this went up to the German high command, and obviously this was then seen as basically Hitler brought in the commando order that anyone from the, the SOE, SAS and the uh, commandos will get caught, interrogated and then killed. Um, classic example is when they first went in to destroy the heavy water plant at the Telemark, they sent in Royal Engineers in gliders. Well, the gliders crashed. The Germans caught them and basically executed all of them. Because they thought they were commandos? They were commandos, oh, right, yeah. and, and they just basically executed all of them there and then. Mm, bad news. I've just yeah. realised you want milk in that coffee, don't you? Um, do you haven't got milk, have you? Right, hang on, I'm going to get no, some. No, it's all right. No, I'm going to get some. We'll, we'll press pause. Okay. We're pressing pause. Or maybe I won't. No. Maybe talk to yourself. Let's carry on. No. <laughs> I'm going to get milk one sec. Back in. We're back in, Woody. Back Woody's in. got milk, he's got sugar, he's happy. And he hasn't had to pay for his coffee. That's always a good thing. Can reimburse me. Right. Uh, t- uh, oh, yeah. So the, the SES commander. Oh, the SES commanders. What are you on about? The, we're on about the commando befeel. The commando befeel. So yeah. I learned the German word for the commando order out of Lloyd's book as I was narrating it. Ah. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Where, 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 is your in, where is your keen interest in World War II come from? And the reason I ask is, right, obviously it's a significant, uh, in, of, inter- of significant interest when we serve in the military. But I also suggested to you recently, maybe about doing like a, some other conflict battlefield tours. And you were like, no, I only do World War II. The reason it being is I, as a kid, uh, grew up listening about my great uncle Reg, who was in the Herefordshires, and it was also as well apparently number two commando who took part in the Saint uh, Nazir raid. So he got killed on the thirtieth of July, nineteen forty-four, and he's buried in Charles de Percy Cemetery. And he was he was killed on a raid to take out some German guns, right? And I heard all about him. And in fact, I've actually f- I found out last night a couple of photos of him. I must get him actually framed. <coughs> and he does actually look like me. There's a resemblance. But I also had a another great uncle called Dennis, who served in the Fifth and Battalion Cameron Highlanders. Then he served in Second SAS. Then he served in the Fifth Belgian <coughs> SAS. Okay. And I used to meet him up at the Malt Shovel Pub in uh, Dudley. And he had a fascinating, fascinating life. And I was always interested in listening to his stories and stuff like that. So when I first did, obviously, Cold It's, um, that got me then hooked on other lesser-known escapes. I didn't realise David Sterling was at Cold It's. That's yeah. how they put him after he kept escaping and recapturing. And that's how they put him to not, so yeah. hoping he wouldn't escape again. Did not know that. Yeah, it was it was a bad boys camp. Mm. But the point is, as I said on the, you may have mentioned it on the last podcast. Yeah, actually, but sorry yeah, if I forgot. Yeah, that. no, 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 it's all right. And that's where the, my interest lies in all these lesser known <coughs> World War Two escapes and lesser known operations. So, why? So you just come back from Norway? Yeah. Right. Why? Why Norway? What's special about Norway? Norway was. Um, same thing as Colditz, or what's his, the Colditz story? But there was also a very good book, which I've got here, and a, and a film called Above Us the Waves with John Mills. And it was these Royal Navy guys, some of them engineers, some of them stewards. Stewards? Stewards, um, serving cups of tea, cake to the officers and that. Military people, yeah, they were, but they were stewards. The Royal is, Navy are stewards. Is that kind of is that kind of like an RAF um, passenger carrying yeah. jets where you have the oh they're air stewards aren't they? Yeah, that's oh, the same thing. But yeah. on on in on board Navy. a ship. Okay, right. So it's a bit of a bluff, isn't it? I know. Orders <laughs> orders obviously come up as ever, vo- vo- and the volunteers required for hazardous duty or special duties. Do you? It's like. 
you imagine it's World War Two, the stewards and stuff like that, and I think, do you know what? I want to do something different. So they, Churchill uh, decided that the Germans had a battleship, a pocket battleship called the Tirpitz. And if that had gone into the North Atlantic, into the Atlantic convoys carrying supplies coming back and forth, like America, it would have changed the whole of the war. So what they decided was, it was it was anchored up in a fjord in Norway by a, a, a city called Trondheim, right? So they wanted to take it out. RAF had tried it and it failed, right? So they decided to set up a covert operation, which was called Operation Title. So they put out an... Title? Operation Title. So they put out an order, volunteers required for hazardous duties. <laughs> Can you imagine, you're a steward, you're an engineer and stuff like that. You think to yourself, I want to do something a bit different. Well, the, I mean, if that happened these days, you'd be thinking... Mm. But I'm going down to the NBC centre. Or I'm going to do. So, I'm going to be. I'm going to be shoveling shit. Or I'm going to be getting rid of dead bodies or something. Yeah. You wouldn't think it was desirable. Yeah. Would you? Well, this one. That's these days, though. They had. They'd. The chariots had, had developed underwater warfare a thing called of uh, chariots, and what it was, it was a torpedo. And two blokes would sit astride this torpedo and guide it uh, to the target. The front part of the torpedo would be uh, detached and slung underneath the warship. It was then, a warhead in it, was it? Yeah, okay. then they would go out and then this thing, which is set on a timer, would actually blow up. Okay. So we captured one. We actually captured one took it back, reverse-engineered it, and then developed our own. And it, we called them the chariots, human torpedoes. So the plan was, up in the Shetland Islands, there was a thing called the Shetland Bus. What the Shetland Bus was, it was the, the Royal Norwegian Navy's special operations. <coughs> So it used to take supplies and agents over to Norway in a fishing boat. And there was a guy there called Leif Larsen, right? So what happened was they got a fishing boat called Arthur and they strapped the human torpedoes to the side of it, went across all the North Sea and they got into the outskirts of the Trondheim field on the, uh, get this right now, the 31st of October. The Trondheim field? Why field? Fjord, Fjord. Ah, big Fjord, lake. F -J -O -R -D. Fjord, F-J-O-R-D, yeah, sorry, 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 yeah. sorry. So they got there, but they were about 10 kilometres away from the Tirpit. But due to bad weather and an engine fault, the torpedo, the human torpedoes broke free. Off their casings, right? So they took Arthur round over to an island, <coughs> outskirts of an island, put all the stuff on board rowing boats and sunk it. But they, it, or, or scuttled it in Navy terms, opened up all the seacocks, they scuttled it, right? They then got ashore. They then split up into two parties. So... There was a place called uh, Stordal, right? So when I went to Norway, I went into Stordal. So this was now the night of the 31st of October, 1942. So what they then did was in two parties with Norwegian guides split up and walked uh, to Sweden. So I read all the books on it. What's the actual movie again? I thought, that's a lesser known escape. I'm going to do this. Right. So I did all the research into it. So I've got a, a Norwegian contact called Hansi, who is ex-Norwegian Army, and he also he trained up the Norwegian Air Force. He's got a, a, a company in there called Southern Breeze Experience. So I contacted him, and we were going to meet up but also he's going to show me another operation another 
special operation. So I'll talk about that in a bit. So I planned everything, and I flew into Stordal on October 31st. Stopped over the next morning, started walking. The day that they started walking in 1942, but I started walking in, in 2023, the 1st of November. But I wanted to do it as not replicate it, not not obviously play it, but experience what they experienced. So I walked in some what they actually right would have had on, except I wore a decent pair of boots. Because no way I was gonna walk in uh, to Sweden in Siemens boots. So I had Burgess boots on, World War Two shirts and the battle dress uh, trousers, a World War II sub and the Mariner's jumper, a 1942 Bergen with all my stuff in it, right? That's not that bad, is it? Yeah, no, and that's it? it there. That's not British, is it? Yeah, it's British from World War II. Hmm, okay. And um, a battle dress uh, jacket. Now, I had a pair of mittens, a hat, and off I started. Now, they lived on rations of sardines, biscuit, and corned beef, and a bit of chocolate. But there's no way I was going to walk that distance into Nor in, in to Sweden living off that. So, Hansi... Hang on, how did they do it then? They got guided. So I haven't got a guide. I'm doing it on like my own, right? So, Hansi left for me at in in Stordal at an outdoor shop arctic rations a stove and and these big massive sausages which were a godsend so i bought some more sausages because they were lovely and i bought um i had some more sausages bought some i had some dutch chocolate to took with me and also <laughs> you and did like the luxury version of the escape. luxury version of this <laughs> And, so and a pair of mittens, <laughs> right? So I thought, and also as well, they were guided up over the mountains. Now, I didn't have a guide. So I, I didn't cheat and look at aerial photographs and Google and stuff like that. So on the actual ground, I looked at it and it was thick forest and everything and I sidelined it. So I started walking. I started walking along all this, all this route and this track. And I always say that, as an escaper, it's lonely. When I did cold it's and that, but unlike cold it's where you can't have a gangle of men walking down all the road. So I, they had obviously two groups of six with Norwegian guys, and they were stopping off at huts and that because they knew all the huts because they were resistance obviously fighters. So I started off at, at um, Stordal, started walking, started walking, started walking, and it is. It's bleak. If you've ever been over to Norway, it is bleak as anything. Oh, been. There's Never a been. few houses. It was it was minus eight, and then I decided to to um, to stop somewhere. And halfway along, I stopped. I can't remember by the name. I stopped at, but I slept the night in this barn. Right. So I stopped in this barn. What sleeping system did you have? I had a sleeping bag. Yeah. Right. A softy three and a bivy bag and a roll mat. And I did a few posts and someone put on out of my post. Don't forget, mate, in Norway, there's bears, bears. and wolves. And I thought, that's not bears and wolves in Norway, surely. So I thought, I'm sat there in my sleeping bag. Everything's all in my sleeping bag to keep it warm. My water bottles, stop it freezing up and everything. I got my stove on, I had some scrag and that and everything. You Go, have no shelter? Uh, I, I took you, a shelter, yeah. but I was in the barn. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. With the door open. Uh, and then I looked at it, are there wolves in Norway? Because I thought, because <laughs> I thought, I thought... Or it, Google. I thought it's, win <laughs> it's winter time. Bears hibernate, so I'm all right. Paranoia going overdrive. Paranoia going overdrive. 
So I googled it, and it come up. There are wolves in Norway, but the last known attack was in the 1800s when they r ripped a girl apart, apparently, in the 1800s. I thought, oh, this is all I need now. So I was in my DOS bag, having to read my book, head torch on and everything, and then, and then uh, this, what I thought was a wolf's sound. Obviously, if you hadn't have Googled or someone hadn't have posted about you, you wouldn't have thought it. You would have thought, oh, that's a sound, wouldn't you? I would have. And hey, I what was the like, story? Did, I was, did I was, you survive? I was like, fucking What hell. was it? Well, I don't know what it was. I wasn't taking that chances. But I looked around where I'd, I thought, <laughs> oh, please let there be a barn that's got a door on. And there was a shed with a door on it. And I went up and I went, please open, please open. I opened this door up. I thought, yes. Chucked all my kitty. Chucked all my kitty in this door. I got in there, and I didn't have a good night's sleep, I must admit. <laughs> it wasn't a good night's sleep. It was like, I could hear this, this howling going on. So the next morning, I was up at... I was up at 7 o'clock. Had a chocolate. Had some water. I started walking. With, can I jump in? With the guides, so what do you know about the Norwegian resistance? What were they like? Well, just generally. When the actual Germans invaded, a lot of the Norwegian, not a lot of the Norwegians, some of the Norwegians took the German side and they said the king of Norway came back uh, to England. But there was a Quisling, or there was a guy called Quisling, and there's a Quisling organisation who worked hand in hand with the Germans. So some of them were traitors to their own people. And the, the resistance would obviously do attacks. And there would be agents as well from the special operations executive in there. Okay. But they just ambush um, German convoys and anything. And they also did the attack on the heavy water plant. So it, it is a fascinating history for, for World War Two. What were the Germans using the heavy water plant for? This is, because this is well before a nuclear bomb, right? Oh, no. They were using heavy water to develop, develop. an atomic bomb. Right, to develop it, okay. They were using it. Okay, mm. so, but it's easy for us to say in obviously Britain who we never got invaded. It's easy for us to say what? Well, why did they side with the actual Germans? Now, some people didn't want to, some people were under threat and stuff like that. So as if like, you know, you do as we say or... Or oh, die. Well, it, it makes sense. I mean, I, I imagine like I imagine the same thing happened. You know, well, obviously we know it happened in other European mainland countries. Yeah. But I imagine the same kind of thing happened in Jersey. Oh yeah. You know where they yeah. were? They were under occupation. Yeah. Like for a long time. But I imagine the same thing was going on there. Yeah. It's just I would imagine that the 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 social repercussions to you if the if the pe if the general like. Good Jersey people who weren't under the influence of the Germans yeah. caught you doing it. You were getting fucked, or after the Germans left, you were getting fucked. You know, it's like um, it's like when you see you read or see or, or see things being put in the film about when places get liberated in Europe. You know, Arnhem, the famous ones, and Arnhem and Normandy and places like that. And then you you get there's the there's the bit, there's the clips of women getting their heads shaved off because they slept with German soldiers and all that, or even worse things happened. I was just going to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Know. yeah. Right. But it's understandable in, under well, occupation. Yeah. People react differently and people, because the, the occupying force will want to coerce people into wanting to help them. Yeah. And they will do that either in nice ways or do it in very bad ways and threats, you know. Yeah. And especially, it's probably the more, the more, uh, the more influential and powerful people are more susceptible to that mm. influence, I think. But, I mean, it's a fascinating history, but but on the, going back on 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 my obviously next morning after a sleepless night after the wolf attack after the wolf attack <laughs> you just made the anxiety made, attack and made, made me laugh actually because in 
in in Oxy Coldies when I was going down the road, there was like dog. This dog was barking. And I remember thinking, "Oh, that fucking dog's chained up." And then when I was in Crete last year, fucking, he got bit by a snake. And some said, "Oh, don't worry about it. None of the snakes are poisonous in Crete." I thought, "Yeah, I'm not going to take that chance." And then I thought, "No, by oh my god, you now it's wolves." Um, so started walking again, and I stopped off at this farmhouse uh, to get some water and they let me in it, by this time it was what I call is a snowstorm you would call it a snowstorm but the Norwegians just call it snowing so I got into another place and the farmer he he let me actually have my um, porridge and my um, coffee which I made in his house but then he introduced me uh, to his father you speak English? Yeah, all the Norwegians oh, speak really? excellent English, yeah. He introduced me to his father, telling me about his grandfather, and he told him about the history of the, um, the valley in World War Two. And they said they're still finding up in the uh, woods, they're still finding um, crash parts of a Halifax bomber which bombed the, the Tirpitz. Oh, wow. So they're having my... Obviously, the porridge, coffee, having a chat about it. They even gave me a, a chocolate bar. And he had a, a collection of old, old like, weapons from World War II. And he's telling me the history of the valley. And this is interesting. The Norwegians thought that if the Germans left, the Swedish and the Russians were going to invade in the valley because they were all farming communities. So what they did, they actually sided with the Germans in that right. uh, in the valley. And what I was thinking was, well, I'm in this house now. It's now the 2nd of November 2023. Now I'm thinking, if this then being the 2nd of November 1943, here's me eating my porridge, having a coffee and my chocolate bar, I'd have had some guys come through the actual door with a couple of Walther PPKs and a Schmeiser pointing at me, me thinking, that's it. Mm. And obviously, because I'm a saboteur, that would be me getting obviously taken off and shot because one of the escaping party, a guy called Evans, he got wounded in a village going through, shot by a Norwegian a policeman and a German one. He got took away, had an operation... They kept him alive and then interrogated him and then killed him. So I started walking along all this route and the snow was coming down big style. And I got into a, another town called um, the Murica. Murica. I think I've pronounced it right. By this, So the first day I covered 13 miles. The next day I covered, I think, about eight, 16 or 18 light miles. Not bad for a 54-year-old. And there's not a lot of light at that time of year either, is there? And you had to move fast. Yeah. So one of the things that the, the agents did, they, they actually slept in a farmhouse. So some I was having a chat with these Norwegians, and they said, oh, we know someone who's got a cabin that you can, you can stop at for the night. So they took me into this cabin. Oh, my God, Hugh, it was luxury. Uh, they they lit a log fire for me. I brewed up my beef stew, had it in a proper bowl. I had a Norwegian sweater on, my battle dress trousers, thick Norwegian socks. Having drinking hot chocolate, listening to nineteen forties music. No, the, where did you get that from? Scene. It was on my iPad. It was Glenn Miller. It was on my tablet, Glenn Miller, and I sat there thinking, "Oh my god." This is excellent. Glenn Miller. And, you know, in all American um, a patrol and all that. And I sat there, just had a lamp on, all my stuff out, and look at the actual route I'd taken. And it was a look, it was like, oh, this is good. And this is good. And then the next morning, still snowing, Ready, had some Aussie porridge, had hot chocolate, made myself a flask of hot chocolate, had water, said goodbye uh, uh, to the farmer and his, his kids and the family and that. Started off again. 
all 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 your morale is up. Now, on the route to my first stop and on the route out to America, I'd seen houses that, if anything happened, I could have uh, dropped off a hillside and gone, look, you know, I've got injured, had all the med kit and everything. This time, as soon as I left, I had to go up this mountain that was like that. Going up there, going up there, going, and I kept having to look back, and the scenery was spectacular. I was going along, and I decided, right, every two hours I'll stop, have a slurp of hot chocolate, have a chocolate bar, have a biscuit, and then off I go again. So I stopped off the top of this mountain. I'm slugging away at this, and, you, and I did not see anything. I've seen signposts for... So the blizzard, the, the snow, sorry, it stopped now. The snow had stopped now, and, and then... Stopped off at this mountain, found a nice little pine tree that had a holler in it, and I did a bit of a talk and that. And then all of a sudden, I could feel tingling in the fingers. So I said, right, I've got to stop now, I'm off again. So I stopped, sent everything on Facebook and LinkedIn and Instagram. And that. By that, the hands were starting shaking. I had a bit more hot chocolate, got the gloves on, starting off again. Still didn't see any houses. I kept seeing signposts saying reindeers, you know, warning triangle saying reindeers and that. Didn't see any of them. Didn't see any moose because there's actually moose there. I'd love to see a moose or a, a reindeer. I'd rather that than a wolf or a bear. Started walking, started walking. You start thinking, just you start to get emotional and stuff like that. You're still going on. You're still going That's on. That's not like you. I know. And you, <laughs> thanks for that. Cheers, man. And you can't stop and yeah, yeah. You know, if you stop and have food and that, we just keep going. You keep going. And the pocket full of sweets kept going. I remember going up this sort of signpost. Did you do the? Did you think about doing the Nor? Sorry, to jump in. Did you think about doing the Norway? You know the Norway bar. That the it used to be a, a thing that some or a lot a lot of uh, allegedly I never went to Norway with the military. Um, they would do when they went to Norway and they would get all their chocolate, they issued chocolate and all they issued sweets. Oh yeah, nutty bag. Yeah, yeah nutty did, bag. And yeah, they put it, they'd melt it, they put it into a clear polythene bag and then let it, and then just let it harden like that. So it's a it's a massive bar of chocolate and sweets. Yeah, I did that. I did, did that. that. I had a nutty bag. Yeah. And then uh, I always remember going. Up, I saw a sign. Um, post where I'd come from he's had 66 uh, kilometres to Stord or thought right I'm near now the Swedish border just kept walking kept had wa you pre-plotted your stop points no okay kept walking kept walking and then I saw a s round a corner I saw civilization, otherwise known as a railway bridge <laughs> 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 and then I saw a big post saying Sweden so I crossed over, did a quick, I've just crossed into Sweden, I've made it. Then you think, it, that's it, it's like at Colditz, I crossed over in, in to Switzerland, I was at a railway station, there was houses, <laughs> and there was a, little shops that could have had something, there was nothing here. Started walking. Not even border control? No other border control, just walked over. I, 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 every time I've done this, I've been thinking I'd love to go hand over my passport and that. So I got into Storlia and I still had to keep walking because <laughs> I, I had another 5Ks to do. Then all of a sudden, the snow started again. It The wind was coming horizontal. I had glacier glasses on. I remember being a Star Wars fan. Glacier glasses? Oh, the big... Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Obviously, being a Star Wars fan, I was expecting myself, I could really do with a taunt on now, those creatures out of the Empire Strikes Back. Started walking, and I saw, starting to see houses and lights, and I come across a customs point. By this time, my battle dress tray, I had a white, like reversible smock on. My battle dress trousers was covered in white, and I went in there. You imagine, I've got a, a World War II reversible smock on, battle dress trousers, which is covered white, and a, that Bergen on my back. They just looked to me, took my hood off, took my goggles off, pull an axe all go with. I said, look, 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 he said, hey, how far is it to the town? They went, over the railway track, take a right. So I got over the railway track, took a right. 
came to this hotel on the side of the railway station and you used to see me, they just stared at me right when I walked in. And I said, have you got a room spare for the night? And the place was empty. And so they said, yes, <laughs> funny enough. <laughs> Made it. I, was, I had a beer, sat down, I had a beer and that. And he, <clears> the <throat> euphoria that creeps over you. And I raised £1,500 for the Royal British Legion. Oh, well done. Well done. It was... Yeah, cool. It was in obviously memory of those men, but it was all, I mean, it was just like, it, it, I think it's one of the hardest things I've done. Really? Because of the weather? Not due well, to... Well, did a lot of miles as well, didn't you? I did 70, 70 miles? No, hang on, not 70, 70 yeah. kilometres, so you're looking about 50 miles in mm. 70 miles, 70 kilometres in the three days. Mm. It's not bad. Not bad at all. Not bad at all. I'll tell you what, I, I, I had a burger and chips on the night. I know I had pizza on the night time and stuff like that. They was actually staring at me as if, like, I'd never eaten in ages. Well, I haven't. I hadn't, actually. And what did the actual escapees have to rhyme what they had? They had a, they had a biscuit? Sardines, biscuits Sardines. and some corned beef. Jesus. I mean, and you don't forget, these guys as well weren't in their 50s. They were youngsters in their 20s. Yeah. Well, I'm bored with duties in the Royal Navy as a steward. I'm going to sit on basically a, a human torpedo and ride it underneath the actual tur pits, and then I'm going to sink the torpedo, and then I'm going to escape over land 70 kilometres in uh, to Sweden. Hopefully I, I won't get interned, which means I'll have to spend all, all the rest of the war in Sweden, and I'll just or get obviously flown back <clears throat> crazy isn't it how the appetite of risk goes through the roof oh when, god uh, yeah when you got when in in times of extreme hardship when you no way that'd be like that i remember when, when i you know it's like the complete opposite when when uh i think the third time i was out in afghan man if you wanted to go out on the ground this is obviously not not sf this is like standard yeah units okay uh, if you wanted to go out on the ground at any less than 12 people you had to seek approval from like two or three levels above the brigade i think it was yeah. fucking madness and then you think about the guys you know we'll jump on a a torpedo it's just been invented <laughs> like a, a, a man carrying torpedo just yeah. been invented what do they call it a, a chariot a chariot i have a paint a i have chariot. a painting of it a chariot yeah oh yeah this is it this is it the painting can you um, say that can you say that uh, that way that way that no, way towards that. you towards you so the camera can see it towards you towards you woody towards you bring it towards you oh yeah, there you go yeah oh uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah, it yeah. the human that torpedo mental. my god i'll have a go but not in wartime <laughs> <laughs> oh, that. i'll have a go and not, not in wartime and not armed either no not armed where'd you get the painting from um Nick Crichton at the um, Old Lemitoni's Rugby Club. Oh, that's the one he painted. He painted it oh, for whoa, me. He painted whoa, it for whoa, me. Okay, yeah, he right. painted yeah, it for that me. Is very good. Is it look at that. Well, certainly, I no. Just I want to look. Never mind. I, the I, viewers. I know. I, I know. Look. I know. Then one of the viewers he said, "Did you hear that?" Then what he said. Then one of the viewers. <sighs> I want to have a look at it. That is really good. Yeah, I like it. Quite the uh, quite the artist, isn't he? Yeah. Quite the artist, my God, nutters, nutters. What is the in? What is the uh, most extreme or most daring escape you think you've come across in your all your research of World War Two? I think that one was, but I'm doing another one in March next year. Go on, what are you doing? The Great Escape. Oh wow! On the twenty fourth and the twenty fifth. Have you got a bike license? Um. Do you know what? <laughs> <laughs> Having said that, I don't think he had one anyway. Right. He didn't have one, and that never happened, actually, on The Great <laughs> Escape. I don't mean, ruin it. Sorry. Don't ruin it. You were telling me he didn't jump that fence on the motorbike. In, a real, in, in the field. The real, the field in the field. film, he did. Steve McQueen actually Fuck did it in the film. But You're in, ruining people's dreams here. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Party pooper. Go on. But... In the real world of it, the three people who escaped were two Norwegians and a Dutchman. Huh. But it was a mass escape. And I've started reading the book um, now, obviously called The Great Escape, by one of the guys who was there. 
started to actually read it and look at do I take the route to Sweden as I did or do I take the route in uh, to Switzerland? Well, talk through the escape at a high level. The Great Escape. Yeah. It was a massive. Why are you looking at me like that then? Oh no, <laughs> it was. Have you not fully researched it yet? Well, I've not fully researched it yet because I've just come back from Norway, so I don't want to give <laughs> anything away. But so I where d- were they escaping from? They were escaping from Stalag Luft Three, which was in Sargon, which is now in Poland. Okay. And it was a mass escape planned, so they were tied down German troops. And those you know the story. Um. They found one tunnel, they all went out of one, they got, and 50 of them got shot by the uh, Gestapo. Hitler organised 50 of them uh, to get shot. Okay, But one of the things I did in Norway, I went and had a look at another special operation. So I went... Oh, you mentioned that, yeah. I, yeah, I, yeah, I yeah, went yeah. back to Trondheim, obviously right. by train this time. It's strange how it took me three days to walk 70 kilometres, but only a couple of hours to go by, obviously, train. I must be walking at a snail's place. <laughs> and I had a night out in Trondheim, which was uh, which was nice to chill out, relax and stuff like that, without going into too much detail. Then Hansi, my Norwegian guide, picked me up and he took me to his village called Holt Darlin. So Holt Darlin in World War Two had a railway going through and there was a special operation executive mission by the Norwegian section to blow up the bridge at the railway. And he took me to the spot where they they actually blew up that bridge. They took me there, right? And it was very interesting in because he walked me underneath the tunnel. But before we went under the railway tunnel, there were these icicles hanging off it. And he just stopped me. Because, you know, as you obviously know, I'm a chatterbox. And he said to me, Julian, do not talk underneath this tunnel. The reason being is, if we talk, the vibrations could loosen off an icicle. So I went to the left side of the tunnel and almost like crept through this tunnel. Really? What the village has done, they have kept the original guard box and the foxhole and the bridge that got blown up and the bend in the actual track as part of their of the village history. Mm. And it was amazing what they did. So Germans are in the, the railway hut, another one's in the foxhole. They, the guys walk down the side of this mountain at this angle place the charges are in December 1944 that's it place the charges crept out again the German without firing a shot and then actually blew up that bridge and now you imagine you're on sentry duty and where the bridge is close to the hut it's not that far it's like from here over, over to the club. 20 metres, if yeah. that, if that. And they they <clears throat> snuck down in darkness, placed the charges and snuck out again. 10 metres, actually, probably 10 metres. And they dropped yeah. it on uh, to a plateau out there in freezing cold and hiked in, tabbed in all that equipment and did that but then the germans repaired the bridge so they then had another task and it was on december the 29th to br- to actually um, blow up 11 kilometers of railway track but they made sure that there was no they timed all the passenger trains because what they didn't want them to do was add on one operation they blew up a track but it had civilians on board so what they then went and did was they watched all the trains going obviously past worked out all the timings then then actually blew 11 kilometers of this uh, track he also took me to the lup the line up um, the position where they stopped at hmm. and then after we um did that Went back over to his mum and dad. Said, "Right, um, quick coffee. Then it's over to the village hall." He 
took me, there's a 11th century Viking church in his uh, the village. Wow. Where you go inside it, but there's... Were, were they pagans? I don't Vikings. know. Can't, they... I'm going to Google it. Go on, keep talking. So they, they had an inner and outer part of the church. And when they had to go, before they could go into the church, they had to leave their axes and swords in a special place. And I went in there, and it was absolutely beautiful. And they had all candles all lit and everything. And they told me about all the history. Which town were you in? Holt Darlin. Holt Darlin. Yeah. And as we came out of this beautiful Viking church, um, I said oh, um, uh, to Hansi, have they got a church service on tonight? And he said, no. The church has been opened up, especially for you. Oh, wow. So I was then taken then over to the village hall. And at the village hall, I gave, I gave a talk on, on my cold its escape to the villagers. They had a little, like, museum in there to Operation Lapwing, it was called. The blown up the railway track was Operation uh, Lapwing. Then Hansi gave a talk on Operation uh, Lapwing. And then I gave a talk on Operation Ur title, and as a gift over to the village, over um, um, to the village, I gave them my escape map and my escape compass. So my oh, nice. that's going framed, and that's going into the history of the, um, the village. So I have here actually, this is a silk escape map of the area and route i took oh, yeah it certainly can um, that was <coughs> that was done especially for me by a company called splash maps uh, david at splash maps got that especially done for me oh, cool. so they would they would carry something uh, like that explain to people why escape maps are made of silk please it, it's so that basically it can be used in any weather and also, if you fall, um, I've seen one in the in the uh, museum at San Mary Glees, where it had a paratrooper who had an escape map as a, a scarf around him. Because you think if you've got mm. if you've got a a normal map, if you've got a normal map, it's going to get soaking and stuff like that so that was issued to special operations executive to air crew anyone who was deemed as you know prone to capture troops yeah that's cool man and they got the, given a, a button compass as well can you get that framed you're gonna get that framed i'm gonna get it framed yeah. with the button compass as well well so where, but where's the is that an original issue button compass it's no it's not no no it's not replica. A, a replica yeah. one so what's different how different is it to the button compasses of today which is just plastic shit it was it was made of metal oh okay and also as well it was interesting that they used to hide them in like a matchbox and stuff like that and sewn in uh, to jackets and everything <clears throat> I mean, you know, if they were actually escaping, they would escape with a silk map and a button compass. Well, the interesting thing is, the escape maps did not have the border crossing points on. Because if they got captured and the Germans or the Axis forces took that off them, they would know the actual crossing points. So they did not, so if they, if they caught them, they would not have anything on there. Mm. No markings, anything. As you know yourself, you can't have any markings on your map because if you get caught in and stuff like that, like, oh, right, so you go in here, you go in there, you go in there. Mm. Crazy times. And then, uh, 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 as I say, this little... Um, the, the Norwegians are friendly people. Such a massive country. I was going to ask you about them, actually, yeah. Friendly people, massive country. I mean, it's absolutely massive. And, and it, there's lots of wilderness out there. Lots of wilderness. I mean, I got told when I crossed in to Sweden and the snow's come across that way. Oh, it wasn't as it wasn't a snowstorm. It was oh, oh, it's only snowing. Oh, it's warm. It's only minus eight. Would you prefer to escape in the hot or the cold? What do you think? 
They used to escape in springtime. That's the best time. That wasn't my question. I know. <laughs> um, I'd go for... I go for the cold. The reason being is you can easily walk up, warm up, sorry, and not get obviously dehydrated and stuff like that. Yeah, I think so. I think I'm in agreement. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, for sure. they used to aim for springtime. Now, in the movie The Great Escape, they're all escaping and it's all nice and it's all clear and everything. When they actually escaped in, in 1944, it was all covered in snow. Oh, oh, even harder to get, uh, get away. Yeah, and a few, the, tracks. and a few of the guys had coldest escapes, and it was snowing, mm. which is not good, because Airy Neve he escapes in the January, and that was covered in snow. Coldest looks amazing. I remember when you gave your presentation um, on it, on uh, the pictures of it. Look, oh, it's amazing. as you approach coldest over that bridge, and if you. Obviously, I'd watch the actual movie, The Cold It Story. When you approach it over that bridge, you can imagine you've just been caught. You've just got your battle dress on, your little haversack and everything. You've been caught. You've been interrogated. You've been obviously given a number. And those those wooden <coughs> gates are slammed shut behind you. And you've just got an exercise yard and stuff like that. And you think, how long is this going? How long's the war going to last? How long is this going to last? What was the largest POW camp, buddy? Colditz was a bad boys camp. Then you had Off Flag Force C. That was Sargon. That was the home of the Great Escape. I think. I think that was the largest one. That was the largest one. Mm. Mm. What have you ever? Have you? Have you considered doing any World War Two escapes in uh, in the Pacific? Do you mean the bridge over the River Kwai? That that would be a bit of a... Bit of a what? <laughs> Amazing. Interesting. That, that can't be the only one. There's been loads of escapes over there, small small scale. That's just a well-known one. I think... I think... Because there was a bunch of POW camps. I'd need uh, to research it. They, they had it worse out there than, obviously, we did in, in obviously, Europe because they, they might stop the... the the Red Cross parcels and stuff like that. There is an interesting one, Italy. Rusty, the QM food bars, yeah. gave me a great book. I've got to read it and have a look at this. And it, 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 it it's um, uh, Mussolini's Colditz. And it's about the, the Italian version of Colditz. Mussolini's Colditz. Colditz. Okay. Yeah, I, I might Where in Italy was it? I, I don't know. I I've not read that yet. Oh, you're not read it yet? Okay. But what is interesting is a lot of the soldiers who escaped from from Italian prisoner war camps, they were sheltered by... Itali Castle of the Eagles. Castle of the Eagles. They were, they were sheltered by Italian... And villagers, because not all of them were actually fascists. And what the interesting fact is, they got into village life and they started going out with Italian females. Right. And what was happening was, they were deciding, well, do I escape and go back to Britain, or do I stop here in Italy in the village? And what they were doing, some of them were actually stopping uh, to marry Italian females. Oh, wow. They weren't going back. It's like there was a thing where a lot of the RAF, not a lot of the RAF pilots, but some of the RAF air crew who got shot down, put into a prison war camp, weren't escaping because if you think about it you get sent back and you're flying again mm. but like they were actually stopping in the, the prisoner war camp and the italians who the british who were escaping out of the italian prisoner war camps are going in uh, to villages getting obviously looked after getting themselves an italian girlfriend and going mm. 
<laughs> do I stop in in Italy with this <laughs> with with this Roman beauty, or do I go back to the East End of London, back over to Doris and the four kids? Yeah, yeah, or back to Skagness, <laughs> <laughs> or fucking Cornwall. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot like that. Mm, I wonder what I should do here. <laughs> yeah. I'll just sit out. Well, the... there's that film, isn't there? Is it? Is it? Oh, is it the part of a story of a film? I think it's based on a true story. It's the Thin Red Line, where the guy, the guy is, the guy is oh, captured, that's... escapes, and then decides to stay on some island in the middle of nowhere. I've only seen the film once. I wasn't a fan of it. Yeah, but he stays on an island in the middle of nowhere, doesn't he? he doesn't want to come back. Kind yeah, of. yeah, yeah. He loves these things like that. And then gets obviously picked up and. Charged, yeah, yeah, because he doesn't, yeah, guess he doesn't want to leave it. Yeah, what are you going to do when you run out of World War Two stuff? Though? I mean, I really like you to transition to things like <laughs> Vietnam and things like that, or Korea. I th uh, there's loads of World War Two stuff out there that that I can still do. Mm. There's loads of stuff. Um, as you know, I went to Arnhem with Ernst. I went to Arnhem yeah. with Ernst. And oh my god, he's such a knowledgeable guy. Knowledge on, yeah. on Arnhem. And oh, we had some great chats about how the operation went wrong. Why did they do this? Why did they do that? Why did Urquhart go off and was like stuck in an attic for 48 hours when no one knew where he was, if he was alive, if he got killed, and that? Why didn't they drop here? Why did they not do? what they did at obviously Pegasus Bridge and all this sort of stuff. And they said, well, there's flak batteries, there's ACAT, there's Archie, be kind of that. Well, that to turn and go over that. He, and we followed the route from Oosterbeck down uh, to the Rhine and um, passed obviously Kate uh, de Horse House, the Angel of Arno. And there's white mine tape still up where the glider pilots gli guided all the guys down over to the river. <clears throat> and one of the stories he told me that one of the guys swam over, but they found him about six weeks later or something, or six like months later. Remember the King's Own Scottish borderers with his jump smock on, his battle dress, obviously trousers, his boots, and actually just a skeleton. He got swept downstream. Mm. And there was operation of the Pegasus, which was in the October, November. And Ernst and I actually did that because it was, we did a 20 kilometre walk. And it made me laugh, actually, because it was a 20 kilometre walk. I got there on the Thursday, have a look to the John Frost Bridge and all that. I mean, so Ernst went drinking till 1.30 in the morning in the square at Arnhem. And then basically... Friday he took me around Oosterbeck. Then I went out and had a few drinks on Friday night and that. So I had to be at this other station. To, he picked me up. Then we did all, all this walk. 20 kilometres. Not problem. Starting at 10. Ended at about, I don't know, half past two. Something like that. You're thinking, oh, that's not too bad. You know, nice gentle walk. It was the route that they took down over to the Rhine for Operation Officer Pegasus. Organised by MI and nine the escape thing i'd walked over the Morvanels, got some obviously training in for, for norway and thought do you know what did the 20 kilometers i wasn't feeling achy afterwards and stuff like that it'll be all right in norway then you get out to norway on the ground the cold snapping at you and stuff like that i mean like normally you'd walk in like a smock <coughs> and a t-shirt i had on a long sleeve t-shirt roll neck sweater brought my jacket that kept us warm glad i had the battle dress trousers on because i thought to myself if i had just normal walking obviously trousers they would have bit through the battle dress trousers and zoot suit obviously trousers underneath tucked in two pairs of socks on not a problem no blisters no hot spots anything like that but you just think, all oh, right, I've done the 20 kilometres in Arnhem, I'm all set. I've done the Malvern Hills, I'm all set from Norway. You go out there on the actual ground. <laughs> oh, God, it, it was different. It was just like, <laughs> it was just like, um, didn't have to cope with, you know, wolves. Uh, someone told me your taxi could have been a deer. It's their obviously mating sound. But I thought to myself, I'm not taking any chances, you know. 
And I was only chatting with the Swedish guy at the bar at, at Storlian. And he said to me, you didn't come over the mountains, uh, did you? And I said, N -n -n no, I hand rolled it. Oh, I said, people go up to the mountains. They walk over the top of the mountains. There's a whiteout up there. Or they get into a ward. The compass isn't working uh, correctly. You know, that going, what the hell? I'm glad I hand rolled it. Mm. And he said, you need a guide up. You, you, you do need a guide Why up Why would the there. compass not work correctly in the woods? I don't know, because he said a whiteout. And sort of, but when you see these woods, our mountains here don't have a lot of, obviously, trees on them, do they? Over Norway, there's these thick spruce mm. trees and everything. It would have took ages. I've still been obviously there now. Uh, it may be. Ended up in Finland or something like that. Yeah. Well, back we go. I don't. My knowledge of those. Scott, you got. We got to wrap this up in a minute because you, you've got an appointment. Um, I say appointment. You've got a dinner, yeah. a lunch. Uh, my knowledge of Scandinavian countries is very shit. I'd love to. I'd, I'd, it's one of those areas. I mean, I'd love to travel the world. I'd love to go everywhere. I don't have that time in my life. But Scandinavia, I, I do want to do. And then the. Uh, and then the. Uh, the Pacific and places. Those islands and all. I'd get around. Perhaps we should maybe. do an escape together. What's this wee, Woody? We. We, you and your, you and your wolves. <laughs> Maybe. When I'm, when I'm older and I've got time. I'm Maybe. good a bit. How old are you now? Yeah. Mate, you're escaping. I'll be chilling the fuck out. <laughs> right, come on, I'll be still be doing on the train, <laughs> mate. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. The old great escape one, I mean, that was either on, the, on a push bike and on an obviously train. I, I remember cold it walking in from from Zingen into Switzerland to Schaffhausen. And I remember this train going past and I'm thinking to myself, where's it done what, what, what that one French officer did? He just cut the fucking train straight into yeah. Switzerland. And I saw this bike tied up. Oh, that's right, because he gets on the train, there's a bunch of Germans on there, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw this bike tied up as well. And there's a great scene out of The Great Escape where James Coburn's is Australian. And he comes across a bike that's tied up and he gets out some some of the wire cutters and he cuts the chain and I could see his bike tied up and I thought <laughs> to myself, that's some wire cutters now. I could do what James Coburn did and I, I, I can just imagine, I'm not like trying to, Trying to uh, uh, trying to ask and explain to the German police why I'm stolen a bicycle. Yeah. And you, look, I'm on this escape. I'm doing it, for, <laughs> and I'm in some German cell. Yeah. <laughs> right. Very no, pleasure. Um, yeah. Thanks for you. Uh, Thank you. How can uh, how do people follow you? <gasps> Woody's WW2 Adventures on Instagram. Oh, that's right, yeah. Not Woody's World War II Adventures on Instagram. Woody's WW2 get... Adventures. Woody's WW2 Adventures yeah. on Instagram. Easy to find. Easy, Easy to, to find. find, yes. Easy to find. And then when are you planning The Great Escape? The Great Escape is going to be on the 24th and the 25th of March 2024, next oh, not year. not far away at all. It will be on the, if I get my maths right, that's the 80th anniversary of them doing it. On the actual day. So I did call... It's Arnhem. Arnhem 80th next year as well. Yeah. Mm. And Normandy. So yeah. I did... And um, I'm thinking of doing Normandy because my great uncle Reg, he, he went into Normandy. And I'm thinking of walking the route from Sword Bridge to Charles de Percy Cemetery. Nice. And that'll be raising money for Tony Lucy's 353. Excellent. Excellent. Hugh, thanks for having us on no, board wait, listen, again. Listen, just a bit of advice. Check for hazardous animals before <laughs> you can do the great escape. I don't mean <laughs> Nazis. I mean like non human animals, right? Just do it. Just, <laughs> just please take my advice. Just take my advice, right? Don't check when you're on the ground already. <laughs> Cold it's it was dogs. I, I, I remember in Crete. Yeah, the 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 rustling of this bush. And I just looked there, and this snake, I'm all joking. You ever see one of the movies where the snake comes out and does that? Just moved my ankle out of the way. Just moved it uh, out of the way. Have you ever seen what? Mamma Mia? No. You know when a snake does that, yeah. it comes out. I thought you said I've ever seen Mamma Mia when no, a snake No, no, I didn't, mate. Right. It comes out, it does that, right. I looked down, I heard the rustling, it looked down, just moved my ankle just in time, and it shuttled off back in out to the bush. I remember somebody saying to me, right, 
did you see what snake it was? Did you take a photo? And I couldn't tell it. I said to him, yes. I picked up a <laughs> stick. I went back to the fucking bush, prodded the bush where the snake had nearly bit me. Because all I could think of, I didn't know if it was poisonous or not. And someone said to me, no, the snakes in Crete aren't poisonous. But I, you don't take those chances. Because there's got to be snakes out there, which well, you have to recognize. It's like same as spiders over here. You know, I oh, yeah. I don't mind. I'm not. I don't mind spiders, but I don't want to get up close and personal because no. you get some dodgy ones and they bite. Where'd that thing going around the bush though? I'll tell you. Yeah. I'll just like, <laughs> tell me. I went, I'll tell me. And then Norway was like, <laughs> no, yeah, there was no howling. You just made that up. Uh, well, you heard a rustling. You know, Where no, did the howling the come Crete from? Crete was the rustling. Right. The howling that not in Norway. when I heard that in Norway, you didn't hear that. You said it was a rustle. You, you no, heard something. I heard this something. This is recorded, Woody. You I know it's recorded. I heard a howling. Yeah, I, I predict. I, heard... I predict you're going to appear on this podcast in the future, <laughs> maybe a year's time, right? Maybe a year's time, and you will recount this. St- I'm going to ask you to recount it. Yeah. And you, uh, it'll be elaborated to where it was a wolf. Yeah, it was wolf. It was, mate. A wolf. It was scratching it was at the wolf, was scratching yeah. at the door, scratching at the door, scratching the door of the barn. Hugh, thank you very much, mate, and a pleasure. Thanks it's for a, pleasure. having us back again. Cheers, mate. Thank you. <laughs>